Hey, what's going on, everybody? Justin here, and in this video, we're going to be doing my December 2019 wrap up. And in that month, it kind of, you know, the holiday season, then the end of the year, and that sort of thing. I didn't get like a whole lot done, per se, like actual reading wise. Um, I did listen to some audiobooks, but even then, overall, I think I only finished eight works. Um, and actually, for physical copies, I only have three books that I actually um, read, though I think one also was on the Kindle. but. Uh, anyways, I only have three, so it means I gotta actually spend, you know, ten minutes editing and putting the books and uh, <laughs> the covers and stuff actually in the video, which I really hate doing. And yeah, I just found out I accidentally defeated, or uh, defeated, yeah, I defeated it. I accidentally deleted uh, the raw footage for one of the videos I did a couple days ago when I uh, was out in a, like, you know, if you guys saw my uh, 2020 uh, reading goals uh, video or no life and channel goals not the reading goals one um, where I'm doing kind of the nature walk in the snow when it's kind of like sleeping and stuff I also filmed a tag video after that and I guess I del I just found out I deleted it so I gotta do that one again so yeah super impressed about that but let's just get on uh, with this video all right so let's start with the ones that I don't actually have and we'll start with the audiobook that I listened to which was a short history of myth by Karen Armstrong reason I picked this one up was I know Karen Armstrong is like a pretty famous author like on like religious studies and that sort of thing I think she wrote like a book called like the history of God or something something like that um, and I actually kind of vaguely want to say I had to read part of it or some chapters out of it or something uh, during like a college course or something um, but anyway so like then I kind of like recognized the name and everything and I kind of wanted like a book on you know some kind of I thought this could be a good blend of like anthropology and mythology and it kind of was, but not going to lie, it was pretty dry and boring. The first, uh, actually the first half, I thought was halfway decent, kind of on the more, um, the more anthropology side of, you know, maybe like what our ancestors and that sort of thing, what they were, you know, their thought processes, excuse me, thought processes might have been regarding sort of, you know, mythology and religion, uh, coming up with certain ideas and that sort of thing. Uh, but as the book kind of keeps going on, it kind of turns into more just like religious stuff, I guess, uh, in a way, which just wasn't kind of like what I was looking for. And it was pretty short work um, in general and just, yeah, nothing mind blowing about it, to be honest. All right. Uh, next one, we have 10 years. Oh, this is the uh, Kindle one that I read for Nat Gelly, and it's 10 Years a Nomad by Matthew Kepnis. Um, and I guess he has like a website called like Nomadic Matt, and uh, essentially he is like a travel blogger uh like kind of in the you know the era of, yeah starting like over a decade ago kind of before like social media was like a huge thing um obviously he must have that as well uh, and it's kind of his story of going from like a regular job in like healthcare or something um and just traveling the world and kind of making a website and everything about that and um how he sort of you know just went about doing that um well but it was okay like i really like the reason i picked up was kind of like the travel adventure um, aspect of it. A lot of the book was sort of him just sort of whining about how his job is still hard and stuff. And uh, while I do agree it probably is hard like maintaining the website um, and you know having like travel burnout or whatever uh, it just comes across as like really just really cringy reading but yeah it's such hard work going to all these places and you know experience the world and you know I still have to do some sort of job to make make money and it's kind of like yeah you know, I'm pretty sure 90% of the population would, you know, trade their jobs just to, like, write about the places they travel. So I'm not saying it's not work. Obviously, it's still work. And there's a lot of that goes into, like, writing, um, like, good, you know, articles and stuff. You're, you know, doing the whole, like, like managing, like, a website. And I'm sure there's probably other aspects uh, to his sort of, like, business and everything. But, yeah, it was just, you know, the... You just, People that don't do that just don't like want to read about and like listen to you like whine about how much you get to travel and stuff and how it's still considered like work and he basically he just wants to travel and have like no work associated with it like at all so uh, it was pretty bad. Also, some of the relationship stuff was just really horrible. Just as one example, um, he at one point he's in Southeast Asia, kind of like teaching English classes and everything. So he's. Um, uh, he's kind of settled down a little bit and he starts seeing one and uh, it doesn't work out because basically he just kind of pops up the without really bringing it up that you know he's kind of done and he's gonna just like leave and start traveling again um 
And then he like wonders why he has like relationship problems. It's, it's like, you know, maybe just, you know, just up and leaving without any real warning. Probably has something to do with it. But like I said, overall, it's kind of interesting here about the travel adventure stuff. Uh, but yeah, just not, just not a great takeaway from the book as a whole. Yeah, as you can see, December was just going super well for me here. Uh, the next one that I listened to on audiobook, let's go with the Warhammer book. I re uh, listened to Scars by Christopher, I see the Chris or Christopher Wright. Um, the reason I wanted to listen to this one was because uh, my favorite, I have some favorite like Traitor Legions, uh, but my favorite Loyalist Legion is probably um, the White Scars that have like a really cool like Mongolian shamanic like influence uh, to them, uh, especially under like Jagged Khan and stuff. So I thought that was really interesting. And this is like the first kind of book in, you know, the Giant Horse Heresy series that's sort of dedicated to them, in like in particular. Um, and what we have here is kind of the internal strife in the Legion of whether, you know, they should uh, follow the Khan, follow kind of, you know, Horus, um, and all the lodges kind of, the, if you follow the Horus Heresy stuff, you know, the, the lodges, um, all the secret meetings and stuff of like which side to join and everything. Uh, yeah, you got a lot kind of going on there, and it was just really interesting to read. And they're kind of a, they're a much different uh, legion, especially for a loyalist legion, um, with their kind of very insular practices and stuff. Um, it was just really interesting to read. Um, obviously, a lot of combat action, sci-fi, you know, laser battles and everything. It's so definitely a guilty pleasure to read of mine, but yeah, just definitely had a good time with that one. And I believe there's one more. Oh, no, two more. It's a lot. Two more. All right, another one that I actually read uh, for NetGalley on Kindle was uh, Beyond the Trees, and this one has a long subtitle, A Journey Alone Across the Canadian Arctic, and this is by Adam Schultz. And what the author did was literally travel the Arctic Circle, the Canadian Arctic Circle, um, with nothing but a canoe by himself, uh, which in and of itself is just like a tremendous, amazing um, accomplishment. Uh, just, you know... I, I mean, me being a kind of vaguely like outdoors and stuff like that would make, scare me to like death to even think about attempting uh, an endeavor. And when I say like the Arctic, I mean like the legit Arctic Circle. When you like look on the map, it's like it's way up there. So uh, even in the summertime, it's like, you know, the conditions are still pretty, pretty rough. You only get I only had, you know, four or five months out of the year where most of the rivers are like ice free and everything. Uh, and he had actually canoe and drag the canoe like upstream half the time and you know, fight through pretty much all kinds of just crazy, crazy stuff like in the wilderness. Um, the major problem I had with the book is that while this uh, adventure um, is an amazing like travel feat, um, you know, in, like you know the realm of like adventure studies, <laughs> adventure studies, I think. Um, it's kind of unclear what the purpose was, like what the grand in the grand scheme of things, like what this was supposed to do. Um, essentially, it's basically just chest pounding because. He's the the real the answer is it was for the sesquicentennial or of like Canada becoming a country or something, um, which you're just like okay, so what does that have to do with like anything? Um, and if you were asking that question, you're in the same boat as me because I have no real idea. Uh, I guess like in the centennial, um, a bunch of canoeists did like kind of a group journey um, across like the major rivers of Canada um, and traversed um, you know the width of Canada. And he basically just wanted to like one up them and be like, yeah, I did it by myself and I did it in the Arctic Circle, you know, where it's like 10,000 times harder. Um, and that's basically it. There's really, uh, there's not really a great like reason for it. And, and what I had a problem too with, uh, with the book as well is while he does detail a lot of like the environment and kind of the nature of the living world, um, like the flora and fauna that he encounters, most of the time he's like, well, I'm on like a really hard time schedule as it is. I don't have time to like, you know, just sit and savor anything. I, I, I have to just, like, you know, just rush through everything as fast as possible to make it, you know, on time before, like, it's impossible when the rivers freeze on the other end, um, if I wait too long, and then the storms are, you know, really bad and whatnot. So if that's the case, it's like, I don't really understand what the point of being out in the wilderness and stuff is if you can't, like, enjoy it. Um, it just, to me, it's just seemed like, I think the author, obviously, in real life, when he was doing it, probably did, but the way he kind of conveyed it in the book, it doesn't come across that way. Though I'm, you know, I'm fairly positive he must, I mean, no one does that if they don't like the natural world and everything. Uh, but there are like these little vignettes that could have just been pounded upon and uh, expanded a lot more. 
I don't know. I just thought there was real potential there, but like I said, just in the book, kind of just came across in a bad way. Um, all right, but then we do have one more book. Um, and this is actually probably my favorite book of the month. Um, one of my favorite kind of nature-ish uh, books of the year, in fact, and it's The End of Ice. And this one has a long subtitle as well. Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. And this is by Dar Jamal, who um, is like kind of an independent investigative uh, like journalist author. Um, he did a lot of uh, writing, I believe, on like kind of uh, the war in Afghanistan and stuff. Uh, but he's also a very like avid uh, mountaineer. Uh, actually, like a lot of the book um, is uh, dealing uh, so, uh, like on mountain passes and stuff um, on the Pacific Northwest um, and also in uh, Denali uh, in Alaska. Uh, what's interesting is this book takes, a, it's very gloom and doom. This is like when I talk about like gloom and doom books, this is like one of those gloom and doom nature books. Um, but he doesn't just expand on kind of, I guess, what was the term I'm thinking for? It's not just climate change in kind of the um, absolute sense, you know, like melting ice and stuff. Though that is a big uh, theme of the book, obviously, with, you know, the end of ice, uh, uh, dealing with kind of the retreat of glaciers is kind of being like the main uh, uh, component of that as part of his book. And sort of even just the changes of, on uh, Mount Denali, uh, just over like the past, like, uh, I don't know, like dozen or so years that he's been climbing it and how even in his lifetime, it's been like completely altered and whatnot. But also like how the living world is like completely directed, excuse me, directly affected by everything. Uh, one of the interesting chapters was actually on like coral reefs and sort of all the bleaching conditions that have been going on uh, and everything like that. So it's not just on, you know, ice per se, um, if that makes sense. But, you know, it's just, I don't know. It was one of those gloom and doom books where it, even though it's really gloom and doom and sad, uh, you just, you feel good reading it, knowing at least you have kind of informed on some of this and how, I guess, the scale and the magnitude of how fast things are starting to progress. And that, like, you know, I'm kind of in like that gloom and doom thing. There is going to be like a threshold at some point, I believe, where it's probably not going to matter much. Like, even if like everything turned, like, we, like, you know, the human race, just every country just did a complete 180 there is like a certain point where it's going to be sort of uh, too late. And I think the author is sort of like uh, reinforcing that viewpoint and that, you know, we, we things have to change at some point just because like, I think a lot of people um, that don't live in uh, certain areas and that aren't, you know, directly affected um, right now, though that's kind of hard to see. There's not that many places that, you know, don't have, you know, like, uh, unfortunately, like longer wildfire seasons, like in California and especially Australia this year. Uh, but obviously, in places where there are like retreating glaciers, uh, just for an example, uh, the parking lots where people used to do uh, these like uh, glacier runs and stuff or and whatnot, um, the parking lots where you would park are like so far away from the actual things now, just because the glacier keeps like retreating. Uh, it's just kind of you know just sad to read about. But like I said, it's hard to see um, how people are not affected. Like how people disagree with uh, sort of like climate change and everything. Uh, but anyways, like I said, the book is beautifully written. Um, I encourage you guys to read that if you want to read kind of a gloom and doom nature book. So there you have it. There's like a bunch of sad books that I didn't like really enjoy. And then also a book I really enjoyed, but it was so sad. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but this is how my December went. So now let's go on to uh, some of the physical books. Let's see. Um, the only other fancy book I read besides the Warhammer book was the fifth book in Glenn Cook's uh, Chronicles of the Black Company, which is uh, Dreams of Steel. Uh, this one was really interesting in that uh, the uh, locale does not change, which is like the first time in five books that the locale, uh, the setting doesn't change. Uh, we're still like uh, kind of like the jungles around Kedavar and stuff. But... Uh, the point of view is like completely shifted to another character besides Croker, uh, which is uh, as the main as the main uh, point of view because there are like kind of side ones in each of the books, but the main POV is not Croker, and I can't I don't really want to reveal who that is because it's kind of like a main thing, like in the first three. Like if I were to tell who that is, um, it would kind of give away some stuff. So I don't want to do that, but I will say it is a female uh, uh, point of view, uh, and it's kind of interesting seeing her. Uh, take charge again if that hopefully doesn't spoil too much um kind of her uh, consolidation of power 
um, in another in another setting, I guess. Um, just really good. Like I said, it's pr it's fairly grim. This is like grimdark before grimdark was a thing. Uh, quite bleak. Uh, but I just love kind of the, the dry humor that's thrown in um, uh, throughout, you know, all the books uh, so far anyways. I uh, just really enjoy it. Uh, if you like dreary fantasy, this is definitely something you should uh, look into. All right. Next up, we have a history book, which is Justinian's Flea by William Rosen and its Plague, Empire, and the Birth of Europe. Uh, this book I thought was ostensibly about... Uh, you know, the Justinian plague and whatnot, uh, which was probably bubonic plague that affected, you know, the uh, mid uh, sixth century uh, CE, you know, probably devastated about a quarter or so of the population of Europe and everything. Uh, the problem I had with this book is that event is kind of like barely covered and it's like halfway through the book and stuff. Uh, I don't know. This book actually has quite a few ratings like on Goodreads. I think it's like in the thousands, which sounds pitifully low, but uh, for like a niche history book that's actually fairly decent uh, i just i don't know i just could not get this one was it's not even that it was like super dry it just wasn't like pertinent information it was kind of like all over the place uh just i don't know just didn't hold my attention at all which usually isn't really like a factor for me with history books usually but something i kind of want to like learn about you know i will just like read it and everything um like i will note sometimes it is like, like some certain books are like dry and whatnot but I still kind of just like suffer, suffer through it for like the sake of knowledge or whatever. Uh, but this one was just like, I'm learning like random stuff that I don't care to like learn about. And yeah, this is not another great book for December, apparently. And actually, this next book has kind of the same problem, but it's done a lot better. And we have The, the Dinosaur Artist, Obsession, Betrayal, and the Quest for Earth's Ultimate Trophy by Paige Williams. And this is all about sort of um, kind of the black market of Mongolian uh, dinosaur fossils. And um, this, okay, the main thrust of the book is uh, there is Alec Procopi, or Alex Procopi, um, kind of did some illegal uh archaeology kind of stuff or pro procuring uh, mongolian uh dinosaur bones uh uh to, was it tur uh, oh my gosh how am i drawing a blank i'm not it's not turbotaurus rex it's like related to tyrannosaurus but it's um uh, not tyrannosaurus uh i think it's tyrannosaurus guitar or something uh or whatever i'm drawing a blank on it uh but anyways he procures like kind of the bones from mongolia and they kind of re uh does a really job reconstructing them because that's like kind of what he practiced he was a, a natural or an amateur sort of uh paleontologist and fossil hunter and uh you know he like cleaned everything up and put it like you know put them together and stuff if it's like a skeletal um specimen and everything and like kind of resold them and that was literally what he did for a living uh, uh for quite some time in florida however um as the stakes were getting higher you know he got you know, a Tyrannosaurus batar uh, from Mongolia was going to sell for like in the millions of dollars and whatnot. Uh, however, eventually uh, politics gets involved and then uh, he becomes arrested for essentially like black market uh, uh, trading and whatnot and, you know, breaking like customs laws and whatever. Though, to, to in his defense, like a lot of these laws are very vague and sort of sketchy um, in the whole grand scheme of things. And even Mongolia, um, the Mongolian president got involved. And even uh, the Mongolians were like, yeah, we didn't like want him arrested or anything. We just kind of like wanted the skeleton back so we could have, you know, something uh, show and everything. Because in Mongolia, a lot of the science, uh, the scientists and stuff do get superseded by the Western scientists. Uh, however, that's very uh, convoluted and murky as well, because a lot of them uh, benefit from that sort of exchange and everything. And Mongolia has very you know murky and muddy laws on just about everything uh, a lot of political corruption all that sort of thing uh, kind of going on but anyways the problem with this book is the author goes into every backstory of every character ever that isn't even remotely related um to anything at all wait i can't remember there's one one part where there's a uh, one uh amateur uh, archaeologist uh, in kind of the 1800s in uh you know victorian england and we're like learning about her entire family history and stuff like her father was like a cabinet maker and whatnot um all for like it's like it's like a tangent on a tangent uh and we learn like i said we learn literally about every single person who like 
makes an appearance in the story. And there's a lot of people kind of involved, you know, obviously, like kind of like black market dealings. Everyone and their mother, most of the time, literally kind of gets like a detailed rundown of their lives and stuff. And a lot of times it's just, it's a little, it's just like too much. It's almost like uh, when you're like studying for like, or not, excuse me, not studying, when you're doing like research for like a term paper or thesis or whatever, you know, you got tons of information here. Uh, but you got to kind of like edit and collate stuff so it, you know it synthesizes into like a nice like narrative where this was like everything you've learned about anything related to the story it gets like thrown in there um and it wasn't like badly written and it i don't know it just <laughs> it just seemed like some of the tangents went on forever and ever and ever i think you learn all about the history of like the lawyer that uh kind of defends one of like the mongolian um like political interests and everything like it's just examples like that it's just just a little bit too much um but it is a very interesting sort of niche topic uh dinosaurs are just inherently cool topic um and black markets are kind of like a cool topic for a lot of people it's kind of a blend together um this is definitely kind of in the spirit of like the orchid thief uh, for example and there's actually another book that i read well, the 2018 uh the dragon behind the glass kind of about the um uh, kind of like black market underground of like these like uh, exotic fish from Southeast Asia. Uh, it's kind of like in that vein. So it's just something I kind of wanted to read anyways. But yeah, like still a good book. But be forewarned that you will learn about everyone's and everyone's like mother in this book. So there you have it. December wasn't <laughs> definitely not like the greatest of months uh, for reading for me, but um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, leave some comments down below about what you think was the coolest book out of all these ones, or probably more importantly, uh, what was the best book that you read in December as I didn't have like the greatest of reading months. Uh, just tell me what you were excited and what your favorite was in the month of December of the last month of the 2010s. Uh, definitely be glad to see what you guys are reading. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Check out all the things with my Etsy shop and the website and Twitter and Instagram, all that stuff. And whether or not your December uh, was a great reading month or not, always remember, read victoriously.